Today's speaker is Ray Cross, who began his appointment as the seventh president of the University of Wisconsin system in 2014. Last October, he announced his plan to retire after a 42-year career in higher education. Today, President Cross is going to share reflections on his tenure in leading one of America's largest and most prestigious uh, institutions of higher education. President Cross will also update us on the status of the integration of the two-year UW centers into the four-year four -year un universities. And he'll discuss the future role of the UW extension and its continuing efforts with a variety of constituents throughout various areas of the state of Wisconsin. We look forward to your pres presentation, President Cross, and uh, we've made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thank you for speaking to us today. Um, if time allows, at the end of the presentation, we have a microphone in the audience, and, um, and I want to remind the uh, audience members that you should um, wait uh, for the microphone to ask a question. So, thank you. Thank you. For generations, the University of Wisconsin has stood alongside the people of Wisconsin, listening and learning, advancing knowledge, and striving to make lives better. Today, the University of Wisconsin system touches communities in every corner of the state, preparing graduates to thrive in a world of dynamic change and boundless opportunity taking on the toughest challenges and turning bold ideas into real-world solutions. Celebrating human creativity, from medical breakthroughs to art that moves the spirit. Creative scholarship, groundbreaking research, entrepreneurial know-how, changing countless lives one at a time. Making a difference in our state, the nation, and the world, expanding the horizons of what's possible, drawing on our heritage and building for the future. It's all in Wisconsin. The University of Wisconsin system. Well, that's my speech. Um. <laughs> I actually think most of you would be more interested in what it, Brad and Rob are going to talk about at one city, and that is sharks. <laughs> Although in some ways maybe that's a metaphor, what I'm going to talk about. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for, and members of the Rotary Club for inviting me to be here. I was telling Ellen earlier that I have been a member of three different Rotary Clubs in the country, and I've spoken to countless numbers. I've forgotten how many. Uh, and even a few uh, clubs overseas. <laughs> but I have grouped Rotary Clubs into two categories. Those groups that can sing <laughs> and those that can't. Uh, I think I'll put you in the first category, but I'm, the judge is still out on that. Um, the, I'm trying to weigh how to deal with some of my prepared remarks. And just for your information, I'm going to talk about none of what Andrea said I was going to talk about. <laughs> so just be prepared. I'm, I'm, I'm retiring so I can talk about whatever I want, right? Uh, and this is something, I want to share something that I think is near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to take my time. And uh, I'll be here for questions. I'm not trying to avoid questions. But three hours from now, for those of you that are left here, you can ask me questions. <laughs> the Madison Rotary Club and the University of Wisconsin have a long uh, standing and a very strong relationship. And these Rotary scholars, I met most of you. I didn't greet all of you, but I met most of you. They are, they are just the latest evidence of your support and your valuing of higher education. And it's demonstrated in these acts. So I think. I want to say thank you to the, to the Rotary Club and also to gra congratulate you as students because this says something about you. So congratulations to both the club and to the students who 
who received this honor. So, well, <clears throat> I'm going to jump over a little bit of this, and I'm, I'm going to talk from my heart in a way that I hope you won't find offensive, but that will make you think twice about who we are, that is the university, where we are as a state and as a community. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with some of the challenges we face, and goodness, there are numerous challenges we face, but I want to put that in a historical context. Um, having worked in New York, Michigan, Minnesota, and understanding how Wisconsin is viewed elsewhere is important because in many cases, the people of Wisconsin don't appreciate and understand from whence you came and why. I'm going to put that in a little bit of context. Uh, I'm going to focus on some of the challenges Wisconsin faced. So let me first review a brief, a brief history of some of the things because it's really important as an educator to put things in context. Context is so important. If you don't understand where you've been and how you got there, it's difficult to understand where you're going and why you should change if you should. How Wisconsin has met these challenges in the past has been an intimate relationship with the university. Today, we proudly announce to the world that we are the dairy state. We emblazon that on our license plates. We brag about it. But in the early 1800s, between 1830, 1840, 1850, we were really the breadbasket state. This state produced one-sixth of all wheat produced in the United States. We were the wheat state. The droughts of 1850, 60, and 70, for a 30-year period there, there were excessive droughts in Wisconsin. And those droughts created an opportunity for chintz bugs to populate like crazy. And those chintz bugs eat grass kind of, of, of they eat grass crops, of which most of you probably don't know this, but corn is a grass. So <clears throat> in the process of destroying all of that, we were also confronted with this invasion of wheat rust, a disease that dramatically impacts wheat production. So between the chintz bugs and the wheat rust, Wisconsin was in serious trouble economically and its future was challenged. In addition to that, there were a few other states that were producing wheat at a greater rate than we were. So the university stepped in, and many of you know this story, but perhaps you don't know all of it. We showed farmers how they can make the switch from wheat to dairy. It turns out that chintz bugs don't like alfalfa. Who knew? The faculty did. <clears throat> Further, the soils and climate in Wisconsin are more appropriately suited to growing forages needed to produce quality milk. So the faculty at Madison began promoting the switch to dairy through direct engagement with farmers. Pictures, and I've seen many of these in our archives, pictures of faculty speaking to large groups of farmers all across this state from railroad cars where they could also demonstrate things and illustrate things. It's an amazing picture. Groups of folks from Wisconsin communities, small and large, surrounding the open door of a railroad car, listening to faculty, explain to them how they could grow alfalfa, how they could control the Colorado uh, beetle that, that impacted potatoes, how they could help them. Well, <clears throat> we became the dairy state. Of course, the rest is history, but there is one exception. The shelf life of milk isn't very long. So we had to figure out how to preserve that and make it useful for longer periods of time. So then the university stepped in and helped farmers convert that milk into cheese. So today, we're also known worldwide as cheese heads. Mine looks pretty much that way most of the time anyway. Unfortunately, today, Wisconsin faces even greater challenge than chintz bugs or wheat rust. So let me describe a couple of these challenges. And this is my key point. 
the importance and value of the university in helping this state address those challenges. <clears throat> the demographic challenges facing this state, which are, are the, it's like the parboiled frog, they just sneak up on you. Even though we know it is one social science that's pretty accurate when it predicts the future. We know how many kindergartners there are today, so we have a pretty good sense of how many high school seniors are gonna be in 18 years. This threatens the state significantly because just about every employer I know is screaming, and I use that word specifically, screaming for talent. Sometimes it's unskilled, but the larger screams are for the more talented, educated individuals. This is not unique to Wisconsin. This decline in demographics is, is going across the upper Midwest and beyond. And it's especially impacting smaller rural communities where even those that are 18 year old, 18 year olds, 18 year olds are exiting faster, moving to more urban environments. So you see that in rural Wisconsin, rural Mich Michigan, rural Minnesota, rural Iowa, I could go on and on and on here. Yet, we're spending significant resources encouraging Chicago workers to come to Wisconsin. We're pursuing military members transitioning to civilian life all around the world, in Germany, in Japan. Come to Wisconsin. Tremendous veterans benefits for those individuals, and it, it, has, it is having an impact. <clears throat> These efforts are good, and the university is a part of this and supports this effort, but Ironically, and I use this cautiously, ironically, little is being done to keep the out-of-state students that come here to attend our universities. Do you realize how many of those we invite here and they pay us to come here? We don't have to pay to go get them, they pay us to come here. It's a tremendous opportunity. We keep about 15% of those students today although there are some campuses that are now over 30% in retaining out-of-state students in Wisconsin. How can the university work in a true partnership with Wisconsin businesses, Wisconsin communities, to keep more of them when they graduate? I believe we can do that by connecting them to businesses, to communities, and to activities throughout this state when they first come here or even before they get here. There are tremendous opportunities in this state for, for all of you scholars that are getting ready to, well, some of you are getting ready to graduate. The ITT guy here, you know, what can I say? <laughs> well, Dom, we're gonna depend on you for neurosurgery. You get, you get back here, okay. Ryan, you're gonna run their financial operation, okay, so. Um, by strengthening and deepening our partnerships with businesses and communities, understanding who's here and how to keep them here and how to let them know of and, and, and welcome them into our operations in our communities. We can leverage the attraction that is the University of Wisconsin to help us address this challenge, just as we dealt with chinch bugs and wheat rust. A second large challenge facing Wisconsin and the world for that matter is access, access to clean, fresh water. Obviously, I don't have to tell you that. It's essential to life. We, in fact, are 60% water. I could weigh 60% less if I wasn't. That would be great. But water is also essential to every sector of our economy, from agriculture to manufacturing to recreation. To just give you a sense of how it impacts the dairy operation, the average high-producing dairy cow drinks as much as 50 gallons of water a day. Yep, 50 gallons. Now that's just a little bit of water. Unfortunately, most of that passes through her. Well, I was trying to be thoughtful in the way I expressed that. <laughs> and unless that discharge is managed properly, the fresh water we all need is threatened particularly where cow populations are concentrated, like Keweenaunee County, and that is a challenge to our rural population. 
The university is doing research and working hard to address this significant challenge. But we need stronger partnerships and more support to do more. This is only going to get worse. In our urban communities, the challenge is somewhat different from the fresh water provided to homes, in particular Milwaukee, as well as other several older Wisconsin cities, this trans the pipes that transport this water to their homes are either lead pipes or they're connected with lead. While lead contamination levels, for the most part, are contained and well within acceptable levels, concerns continue to grow as those levels inch up. The university is doing research and working to help address this problem, but we can do more with support and with stronger partnerships, and if we don't, we risk way too much. But wait, this challenge, fresh water, <laughs> gets even worse. Thanks a lot, Ray. Here's really good news, right? Uh, our lakes, rivers, streams are increasingly being threatened by a growing population of invasive species, which adds significant, significant risk to our already fragile water systems. But just as we did in the 1800s, the university has been working to find solutions to these challenges. The Freshwater Collaborative brings together just about every campus in our system, <coughs> excuse me, to work on different aspects of these threats. Whether it is the School of Freshwater Science at Milwaukee, the Center for Limnology right here at Madison, known around the world by the way, the only ballast water testing facility on the Great Lakes is at Superior. The research being done at Stevens Point in their northern aquaculture demonstration facility, the Lake Superior and Green Bay Estuary Research Centers, the River Studies Program on the Mississippi at La Crosse, the Fox River Research at Oshkosh, or research related to well water contamination from CAFOs at Madison, Platteville, and River Falls, just to name a few of the things we're doing. Yes, we're working on these challenges, but we need deeper and stronger, more committed partnerships to effectively address them in a timely fashion. Ironically, at a time when the value, and this is my deepest concern, at a time when the value and expertise of the university has never been needed more. Let me repeat that. Never have we been needed more. We are faced with what may be our greatest challenge, an American public that distrusts, disrespects, and does not value experts or intellectuals. In some circles, even the value of a university education is being questioned. It was never in my case. When I was growing up, my parents had very little, but education was really important to them. As Tom Nichols writes in his book, The Death of Expertise, Americans are rejecting the advice of experts to assert their autonomy. Today, all things are knowledgeable, and every opinion on every subject is as good as any other. <laughs> While the internet has given people access to more information than ever before, it has also given them the illusion of knowledge when in fact they are drowning in data and cherry picking what they choose to read. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Given the complicated and dangerous challenges facing Wisconsin and the world, this should be disturbing to all of us. In interestingly, the university and the state faced that challenge, that very same challenge in the 1800s as well. As Charles McCarthy, who, Charles McCarthy in the history of Wisconsin is just such a great person, uh, was educated under Bascom, as was Van Hise, Follett, and a number of others. Just a, a great guy, and he, he helped set up the Legislative Reference Bureau, and in doing so, that became the model for the Library of Congress, and he was called upon many times to help the Library of Congress get established and why. 
As McCarthy noted in his book, The Wisconsin Idea, pioneers in this state did not think much of experts from the university. There's nothing new about that. It existed back then. They believed, as he tells it, and I like this line, he says that a fool can put on his coat better than a wise man can do it for him. The thinking at that time was related to, are these people really knowledgeable? Are they experts? Thankfully, the university overcame this distrust by exercising the Wisconsin idea in its most basic form, becoming an invaluable partner with people from every corner of the state as well as every community, every business, every local government, and most importantly, a respected resource for state and national legislators. We engaged directly with the people and the challenges they were facing, and we went to them. We brought the research and ideas spawned in our labs, in our classrooms, and engaged them directly through demonstrations in their barns, in their fields, in their living rooms, at town hall meetings all over this state. Pictures are bountiful showing that outreach. That's how we overcame the distrust. We became trusted partners through that process because we engaged directly with them as partners in the challenges that they were facing. It's widely known throughout higher education that during the Depression, the people of Wisconsin valued the University of Wisconsin so much that they would not allow legislators to cut state funds to support the university. They wouldn't let it happen. That was amazing. When I was in New York, that was a rumor that I had to validate. The university was, to per was perceived to be of such great value because they clearly understood how it impacted their lives and improve those lives. By, ledgering, by leveraging the university and our assets, we can address these problems and better challenge and better build a future that we all desire. Let's take the freshwater challenge as an example. We are ideally, ideally located between two of the largest freshwater bodies in the world, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. On our western border, the Mississippi, the largest navigable river in North America, exists. Inland, we have rivers that are beautifully linked to those larger bodies, making transportation of goods and services so useful for so many years. And for crying out loud, we have more lakes in Minnesota, for goodness sakes. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing that. Uh, this is a water-based state. We are in the center of the world's most useful fresh water. Wisconsin, in Wisconsin and working together, we can make Wisconsin the place where people from all over the world, all over the world, come to find solutions to their water problems. But we have to do it first. We have the location, we have the experts, we have the labs, and we know the challenge well. Can we create the support and partnerships we need to meet this challenge because we, because we can't do it alone. Never in the history of this wonderful state have the people of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin needed each other more than we do today. Never. We seek your help, your support, your criticism, your counsel, but we need your partnership. Will you help us rise up and seize this moment, this opportunity that awaits us. We can turn these challenges into benefits, just as we did in the 1800s. Will you criticize us when appropriate, counsel us when we need it, support us during difficult times, and regularly engage us as a trusted friend? That is the essence of the Wisconsin idea, improving the human condition for all the people of Wisconsin and beyond. That is why we're proud to proclaim that this is all in Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Susan Schmitz is our 
microphone uh, operator. <laughs> Stu Levitan, UW Law, 1986. Could you reflect on the legacy of what Scott Walker as governor and his appointees as regents and the legislature have done to and for the University of Wisconsin over the last decade? Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I think history books will reflect on that more accurately than I will. Um, obviously, the challenges facing the state uh, through that period and the challenges that continue to face the state, we all have to deal with, and yeah. my argument is the university needs to be a trusted, engaged resource during that process. Okay. She's gonna get her track shoes on. Right. Good, I got it, I'm on it. <laughs> Uh, could you reflect on the Wisconsin idea as um, <clears throat> affecting uh, health care in, in, in the state and possible integration of uh, various um, large institutions within the system to do that? Um, that's a huge question and I'll try. Um, uh, the challenges for uh, providing not only educated and um, uh, ap appropriate medical professionals, be they doctors, and or the professional roles that other positions in, in healthcare are needed, are most acute right now in rural Wisconsin. Uh, I've been working closely with Marshville Clinic right now, and they're, they're, they just cannot attract talent. Um, and they're wondering how do we effectively serve these smaller communities throughout Wisconsin. And they're trying to find ways to do that cost effectively. I really, I, I, uh, having, w having visited a number of these hospitals from Mayo to Marshfield to Aspirus, to, I could go on and on here, and understanding the challenges they face, um, much of what we do in the College of Medicine in uh, population science area is so important to the future of health in this state. Um, and I hope that as we continue to develop that, that we will also be very sensitive to the small communities and rural needs of health care. That is really important. It's also important to note that when I talked about the demographics, there's virtually no growth in the age group of 18 to 65. I think it's less than 1% thereabouts in the next 20 plus years in this state. That's the prediction. No growth in that population. The growth will be in those people that are 65 and older. They look like me and, of course, some of you. <laughs> uh, that, that exacerbates the problem you're talking about. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming today and for talking about those topics which are so poignant right now. My name is Joan Ziegler and I have a question about being the dairy state. I know that our farmland is quickly changing in use. We've lost over 500 dairy farms in Wisconsin this year alone. Do you see us as a dairy state in the future or what is the university looking for the next kind of um, opportunity in agriculture? Uh, yes, I do see us as a dairy state. The interesting fact is that I think we lost 10% of our family farms this year and I believe the previous year was close to that. So we've had a period of time where we've lost a number of farms. But the population, of the cow population is roughly the same. So it's just they're getting bigger. And on top of that, the cows are producing more. If, if my dad in our farm knew what some of these cows are producing today, he'd, he'd roll over in his grave. It's unbelievable the kind of production. That, and, and the improvements in protein and solid contents and that, uh, content in that milk is really impressive. 
it, we just we just secured support for an investment in research uh, in the environmental issues surrounding f uh, with the DAG, the DAG, the DAG, the Dairy Innovation Hub. We just secured that support. That's really going to be helpful as we add faculty to do that uh, and to understand how to produce products on, from dairy-based uh, materials. So it, it's I'm looking forward to the future when other states, including California, where they're having trouble maintaining all their large farms. Uh, California produces more milk than we do, but they don't produce as much cheese as we do, so we're still a dairy state, you know, <laughs> on California. But uh, but they're having, because a lot of their work is concentrated in certain areas, and that is really difficult. They'll be coming to us for how to solve these problems, I hope, in the future. Thank you for being here today. Uh, wondering if you would comment on a couple of those items, such as the integration of the two-year campuses um, into the uh, four-year campuses, and also um, the challenge that's being faced by liberal arts education around some of the uh, schools in the system. Uh, well, let me start with the last one, Ron, first. Um, uh, the, the, it, when I was in college in the late 60s, or 70s, early 70s, um, about 65 to 70 percent of the students going to college indicated that they wanted to go to college to become a better person, to understand who they were, understand how they fit in the world. Today that's reversed. 70 plus percent of the students going to college are going there to get a job, to prepare for a job. I think that's dangerous, but we can't walk away from that. So how do we integrate the liberal arts into career professions and do it well? because that's incredibly important. We aren't just in the business of preparing people for a job. That's, you hear that again and again from legislators and it irritates me. <laughs> that's the role of a technical college. We are a university. We're doing much more. There are four purposes, principal purposes, for someone to go to a university. Number one, to find out as as Newman wrote about a long time ago, find out who they are, what they believe, what their values are, how do they hold that. Secondly, how do they fit within a community? What's my part as a role in this community, this community, etc. Third, Jefferson articulated nicely the importance of an educated populace to sustain a democracy. Our democracy is being threatened today because of that. Fourth, 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 we prepare people to participate in the economy. And if you're a research university, to add to knowledge and advance that. Those are four, depending on which kind of institution you are, purposes for a university. We cannot abandon that just to embrace preparing someone for a job. Because we all want employers that do all those other things, not just their job well. And I would, I would argue that doing those things well will prepare you to do your job well. The second part of your question was, or the first part, depending on how you look at it, was what about the success of merging the two-year campuses and how are they doing, et cetera? The two-year campuses, there are 13 of them, all but two of them are located in what I would call predominantly small and rural communities. Those that are located at Richland Center, um, Barron County, uh, Mar Marinette, those campuses were experiencing enormous enrollment declines. Oh, in excess of 50%. You just can't sustain those. So we had to find a way to reduce the administrative costs without abandoning our outreach to those communities. And so um, they have been, those, camp those institutions have been subject to at least three different reorganizations in their history. In the beginning, they were centers, part of education. They were, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, so this was really important for their viability. And we cannot, I had county executives call me when we were talking about this and say, Ray, please, please, whatever you do, don't close that campus. Please do everything you can to keep it open. That would devastate our small community. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, President Cross, for that uh, presentation. And uh, for the first time this year, we are adjourned. <laughs>